Okay, today we are going to pick up with American imperialism. Um, we're going to talk a little bit before Spanish-American War, but most of the information from today is happening after 1898 um, and the conclusion of the Spanish-American War. We've got two essential questions for this lecture. Um, first, what strategic and political factors led America to become an imperial power? And second, what were the main consequences of American imperialism? Um, make sure you write these down either at the top of your notes page or in your notebook, someplace where you can reference them, um, as these are the questions that you should be able to answer um, when the lecture is over. So imperialism. By the war's end, the United States was occupying four of Spain's former colonies. Many Americans believed they should annex them. These American imperialists saw this as a unique opportunity, pointing out how European powers had recently acquired colonies in Africa and Asia, so they believed that the United States should take its own colonies before there was nothing else left to grab. These imperialists gave these arguments on behalf of the United States. Four arguments for colonial expansion. Um, first, the need for raw materials and markets. The United States was now an industrial power. Colonies could provide needed raw materials for factories, a guaranteed market for manufacturers, and a place for farmers to sell their surplus crops. Two, strategic reasons. Some Americans believed colonies would promote American naval strength with naval bases throughout the world. America would be able to maintain a powerful navy to protect its interests. Um, third, nationalism. Some saw colonial expansion as a means of showing that the United States was a great and powerful nation. They argued that the European powers were gathering colonies in Africa, Asia, and the Pacific, and that the United States should grab its own colonies before nothing was left to grab. And then finally, attitudes toward other people. Many Americans believed in Anglo-Saxon superiority, that Americans were a superior race and should rule others. Progressives believed that by spreading American institutions, they could help others. Um, and missionaries wanted to convert native people to Christianity. Um, Alfred Thayer Mahan. Um, Alfred Mahan, president of the Naval War College, was America's leading advocate for imperial expansion. Theodore Roosevelt was one of Mahan's followers. In his book, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, Mahan focused on the harsh political realities of expansion. Mahan argued that to achieve world power, a country needed a powerful navy. For this, a country also needed a large merchant marine to supply its sailors. Finally, the world, finally a world power required colonies and naval bases to provide coaling stations for its steamships, and to create the trade needed to support its merchant ships. Because other powers were also competing for naval supremacy and world markets, Mahan believed it was essential for Americans to seize control of the Pacific trade routes, to construct a canal through Central America, and to dominate the Caribbean region. Geographically, Americans would then control the sea lanes from the Caribbean Sea across the Pacific Ocean all the way to China and Japan. On the flip side, there were some anti-imperialists. Um, the United States itself had once consisted of 13 colonies. Even as late as the 1890s, many Americans felt uneasy about forcing colonial rule on others. Opponents of colonialism, like Mark Twain and Andrew Carnegie, felt imperialism violated the basic democratic principles of self-government on which the United States was founded. Some of these anti-imperialists formed the American Anti-Imperialist League in 1898 to oppose the acquisition of new colonies. Um, in the end, imperialists won the argument. After the Spanish-American War, the United States acquired a colonial empire consisting of the Philippines, Guam, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Samoa, and Midway. One U.S. Senator and Anti-Imperialist League member mourned the danger that we are to be transformed from a republic founded on the Declaration of Independence into a vulgar common empire founded on force. A congressional resolution passed just before the Spanish-American War had guaranteed the independence of Cuba, but even this island came under informal control of the United States. Cubans were forced to agree to the Platt Amendment, which gave the United States the right to intervene in Cuban affairs at any time. All right, let's talk a little bit about our acquisitions. Um, first, America's presence in the Pacific. Um, the Philippines first. Um, Filipinos were greatly disappointed when the U.S. Congress decided to annex the Philippines instead of granting them independence. 
Um, in fact, Filipino rebels fought against this new American colonial rule um, until they were finally defeated in 1902. Um, in Hawaii, the Hawaiian Islands once provided a refueling station for American ships. American settlers built sugar and pineapple plantations on the islands, and missionaries were also sent to Hawaii to convert the natives to Christianity. Um, in the 1890s, Queen Lilio Kalani, the native ruler, um, tried to take back political power from all the American landowners. Unfortunately, in response, the American landowners overthrew the queen, um, and Sanford B. Doyle, um, Dole, pardon me, a lawyer led the provisional government while it worked out plans for the United States to annex the island. Um, Dole had worked to limit native rights in 1887, and he was also instrumental in overthrowing um, the Queen in 1893. When President Cleveland refused to annex Hawaii because of the planters' actions and seizing power, um, Dole served as Hawaii's president. After the outbreak of Spanish-American War in 1898, Congress finally voted to annex Hawaii. Um, Dole served as governor of Hawaii from 1900 to 1903, and one of his cousins developed the Dole Pineapple Company, which is why that name um, probably sounds rather familiar to you. Um, a couple other Pacific Islands that we need to mention. First, Guam was an important port of call um, for Spanish ships crossing the Pacific from Mexico to the Philippines. In 1898, following the Spanish-American War, um, Guam was taken by Spain by the United States. Um, today, it is an unincorporated territory of the U.S. And then Samoa and Midway. Um, Midway had become American possession in 1867, even before the Spanish-American War. Um, in 1899, following the Spanish-American War, Samoa was divided between Germany and the United States. Um, these three Pacific islands provided valuable naval bases and refueling stations for American ships traveling to Asia. Um, America and East Asia. Geography places Americans in an advantageous position for trade with East Asia. Um, we're separated from this region by only the Pacific Ocean. Um, clipper ships brought Chinese tea and other goods from East Asia to the United States. After 1898, control of several Pacific islands gave the United States greater influence in the Pacific. These colonial acquisitions also increased American opportunities for trade with both China and Japan. Um, a little bit more about China. In China, European powers had already established exclusive spheres of influence or areas where they enjoyed special privileges in the 1850s. The United States did not have a sphere of influence there, but had long carried on active trade. Um, and other, if other nations were permitted to partition China, so car carve it up, cut it up, um, the United States would likely be blocked from future economic activities. Um, U.S. Secretary of State John Hay was anxious to protect American businessmen and investors he worried that American trade would be shut out of China by these European superpowers. Um, Hay saw China as a vital market for America's new industrial economy. So in 1899, John Hay announced the Open Door Policy, which gave equal trading rights to all foreign nations within China. Hay sent notes to the other major powers and declared his policy to be in effect. It was just a few months later in 1900, a rebellion erupted in China. It was led by the Boxers, a group opposing all, any and all Western influence in China. The Boxer Rebellion threatened the lives of foreigners living in China. An international army with U.S. participation was sent to China where it crushed the rebellion. Um, John Hay announced that the United States would oppose any attempt by other nations to use the rebellion as an excuse to dismember China. Um, a little bit about Japan. The United States opened an isolationist Japan to Western trade and influence when Commodore Matthew Perry landed there with American gunships in 1853. By the 1890s, Japan had adopted Western ways and had become the first Asian industrial power. Japan also adopted imperialist policies, defeating China in 1894. And in 1905, Japan surprised the West by defeating Russia in the Russo-Japanese War. President Roosevelt brought the Russians and the Japanese together and negotiated a peaceful settlement in the Treaty of Portsmouth, and he won a Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts there. Um, America in the Caribbean. Um, we learned earlier that the Spanish-American War gave the United States direct control of Puerto Rico and indirect control of Cuba. These acquisitions led to increased American interest in the Caribbean region. Um, why was the Caribbean so popular or so important to the United States? Three big reasons. First, hemispheric security. 
The United States sought to keep foreign powers out of the Caribbean because they might pose a threat to U.S. security. Two, economic interests. The Caribbean region was an important supplier of agricultural products like sugar and provided a valuable market for American goods and investment. Um, and three, a need for a canal. The Spanish-American War demonstrated that the United States needed easier access by water between the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. The most likely way to achieve this was by building a canal through some part of Central America. Um, Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is a small island in the Caribbean Sea, 100 miles long by 35 miles wide. It became an American possession after the Spanish-American War. In, in May of 1900, the U.S. government established um, a civil government with a governor, an upper house, and a lower house um, in Cuba. Um, Cuba is the largest island in the Caribbean. Um, Congress passed a resolution before the Spanish-American War not to annex Cuba. Nevertheless, after the war, Cuba became a protectorate under American control. Um, U.S. forces remained on the island, and American businesses, businesses invested heavily in Cuba. Cubans were forced to agree to the Platt Amendment, which gave the United States the right to intervene in Cuban affairs at any time. Um, and the Platt Amendment was not repealed until the 1930s. All right, the Panama Canal. During the Spanish-American War, warships in the Pacific Fleet had to sail 16,000 miles around the tip of South America to reach the Caribbean. This highlighted the need for a canal to send ships back and forth between the two oceans instead of having two separate naval fleets. The Isthmus of Panama, the narrowest point in Central America, was the best place to build this canal. Um, at this time, Panama was part of Colombia. The United States and the government of Colombia entered into, into negotiations but could not agree. Um, while President Roosevelt was waiting to hear from Colombia, he struck a deal with Panamanian rebels who wished to obtain their independence. Roosevelt sent a U.S. warship to Panama to protect the rebels when they took action. Immediately following that uprising, Roosevelt recognized Panama as a new independent country. Um, in return, the new government of Panama gave the United States complete control of a 10-mile strip of rainforest through the center of Panama, known as the Panama Canal Zone. Um, there were many challenges. Uh, President Roosevelt ordered the building of the canal almost at once, so work started almost immediately. Um, construction of the canal presented lots of problems and political obstacles. Uh, construction of its 51-mile length took 10 years and cost thousands of lives and $400 million. Uh, because the canal crossed landforms at different elevations, engineers had to design a series of six giant locks. Panama's tropical climate posed a special challenge. Um, workers labored in intense heat as they cut through mountains and dense rainforests. Heavy rain caused frequent mudslides. Um, Dr. Walter Reed had just discovered that yellow fever was spread by mosquitoes. So to reduce the threat of yellow fever, Dr. William Gorgas of the U.S. Army ordered all swamps drained, vegetation cut down, and all standing water sprayed with oil to prevent further breeding of mosquito larvae. Um, the Roosevelt Corollary. The Monroe Doctrine had prevented Europeans from establishing new colonies in the Western Hemisphere. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, American governments extended the Monroe Doctrine by intervening in the Caribbean to protect America's economic interests. In 1904, President Roosevelt barred European countries from using force to collect debts owed to them by the Dominican Republic. Roosevelt declared that the United States would collect the debt for them, acting as an international police power. He called this the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, it became popularly known as the Big Stick Policy, since Roosevelt boasted he would walk softly and carry a big stick. The corollary was often used to justify sending U.S. troops to the West Indies and Central America. Frequent interventions in Haiti, Nicaragua, Honduras, and the Dominican Republic were deeply resented. Um, by Latin Americans. So our presence there um, created a whole lot of hostility between Latin Americans and um, Americans. Um, Taft and his dollar diplomacy. President Taft encouraged bankers to invest in the countries of the Caribbean region. His use of American investment to promote American foreign policy goals became known as dollar diplomacy. If a Latin American Latin American country could not pay off its loans on time, the U.S. government then sent in troops to make sure the money was repaid. 
Um, so for example, U.S. bankers lent money to Nicaragua. When the government had trouble making its loan repayments, U.S. bankers sought control of Nicaragua's railroads, customs duty, um, and national bank. Um, when the Nicaraguan government refused to agree, President Taft sent in the, in, in the U.S. Marines. Um, so he attempted to use dollar signs, but just like Teddy Roosevelt, um, was not afraid to kind of send in some muscle if necessary. Um, and then finally, Wilson, President Wilson sought to distinguish his presidency from the bullying tactics of earlier presidents, um, but unfortunately events soon prevented him from keeping this promise. Uh, Wilson quickly followed the pattern of Presidents Roosevelt and Taft by sending troops to Haiti, Nicaragua, and the Dominican Republic to protect American interests. President Wilson also expanded America's colonial empire by purchasing the Virgin Islands from Denmark in 1917. Um, Mexico was already undergoing a violent revolution when, when President Wilson became the president. Uh, Wilson refused to recognize the new Mexican government, which had seized power through violence. Instead, he adopted a policy of watchful waiting. Uh, when troops of the rebel leader Pancho Villa murdered Americans in New Mexico and retreated across the border, Wilson reacted. Um, he sent an American expeditionary force into Mexico under General John J. Pershing to apprehend Pancho Villa. Um, nevertheless, Pancho Villa eluded a capture. Um, Wilson finally withdrew troops from Mexico in 1917 um, when the United States entered World War I in Europe.